Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 1197, July the 21st, 2020, Tuesday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, today is a Towergate video that you want to stick around for the entire 30 minutes. Let's start right here with uh, probably, I guess, the biggest story of the day yesterday, which uh, appeared really only on one major news site, and that was the Gateway Pundit. Because yesterday on the Gateway Pundit, they did a story where they name who they believe is the primary subsource for Christopher Steele. This person's name is Igor Danchenko, D-A-N-C-H-E-N-K-O. Igor Danchenko being named as the primary subsource for the Gateway Pundit. Uh, this is coming from about four different sources. The most one you might be obvious with, uh, or the one you might most you might be most familiar with, would be Stephen McIntyre. Of course, McIntyre is one of his Twitter. He's one of the guys I check his twi Twitter feed from time to time. Uh, he's come up with some pretty good tips on the RussiaGate story. Been following it like I have uh, for uh, this entire time, and uh, he cites three other sources in addition to himself who've all gone through and checked this out, checked all the boxes, you might say. And he said that uh, he's better than 90% sure, <clears throat> excuse me, better than 90% sure that Igor Danchenko is the primary subsource. Danchenko is a Russian uh, national who came to the United States to study at the University of Louisville as a young man. And he remained here to work, and while doing so, he traveled around the world working as a business consultant. Danchenko has also worked with Adam Schiff's star witness from the Ukraine impeachment show, Fiona Hill, the star witness for the Ukraine impeachment hoax. The star witness for the bug-eyed fool was Fiona Hill. Igor Danchenko is a good friend of Fiona Hill. They worked together at the University of Louisville where he got his PhD. Uh, while at the University of Louisville, uh, Danchenko got a law degree and he has worked primarily as a translator. Clearly he speaks fluent Russian and I think he speaks some other uh, European languages as well as he's also fluent in English. His Facebook page says that he is a Russian Eurasian political economic research analyst who practices, get this, due diligence. Due diligence. How many of you read the transcript, the interview with Mr. Danchenko and the FBI analyst and case agent one? He drops the term due diligence quite regularly. In 2016, Danchenko was in Ukraine. In April of 2016, Danchenko was in Ukraine. Why is that? Because we now know that uh, Christopher Steele had put him on Manafort's tail. He said, I want you to check out Manafort and his corruption specifically dealing with Ukraine. The problem is, this is in April. Apparently, still wasn't brought in until June. Then he went from Ukraine to Moscow, then to New York, and then to London, where he met with Steele. Dinchenko also worked with Fiona Hill at the Brookings Institute. The Brookings Institute. <laughs> That's where you'll find the who's who of George Soros puppets. Who are? It's, this is a left, hard left wing globalist George Soros associated. They're tied to the Atlantic Council. Think of any major left wing Soros type globalist organization. The Brookings Institute is in bed with all of them. And that's where Fiona Hill worked. 
along with Danchenko. So they worked together at the University of Louisville, and they worked together at the Brookings Institute. Fiona Hill, the Bug-Eyed Fool's star witness. You'll find other names over there at the Brookings Institute, such as Ben Bernanke, Benjamin Witz, who heads up the lawfare, the guys who've really been running the sort of legal part of the coup against Trump since day one. You'll find Janet Yellen there at Brookings and Mike Mullen, Admiral Mike Mullen, who's part of the coup. Fiona Hill was outed by Roger Stone as a spy on the Alex Jones Show in 2017. Roger Stone. And you know what he said after he outed her on, on Alex's show? He said, and for this, for outing her, I'm sure I am going to be targeted. Fiona Hill worked for the George Soros Open Society from 2000 to 2006. She served very closely with Eric Sharamella. Sharamella at the NSC and, she, and, uh, and was also, she was also the uh, NSC, not, not, it, she worked with Eric Sharamella at the NSC and she was also the NSC Senior Advisor for European and Russian Affairs under Victoria F. the EU Newland in 2016. Sharamella had previously held the post as the acting senior advisor for European and Russian affairs before his good friend Fiona Hill took over. There's a lot more, but I have to keep this uh, down because I'm limited in time, but you can simply start Googling uh, Mr. Uh, Donchenko Igor, I-G-O-R, Danchenko, D-A-N-C-H-E-N-K-O. You can start Googling him. Now he's already, just since his, this happened, he is, boom, his Facebook's now gone dark. Fortunately, people captured some screenshots from it before it did. He's gone underground. Now that he has been outed, he has gone underground. I've also done some further research, going back to my notes, back to my timeline, reading some other things, and I have concluded I am absolutely certain that the person that they're referring to uh, in this transcript, which is also, he's referred to in the dossier as source D, and mostly source E, sometimes, sometimes source D, is Sergei Melian, the Belarusian uh, national who's a U.S. citizen, who of course is denied being any part of this whatsoever. We'll get into that a little more in a minute. So I went back and I read that damn transcript again, but this time I plugged in the two names just to make it easier on me to understand. Because remember, Sergei Milion is the guy who provided about half of the, pretty much the bulk of the of, of, of the three damaging stories, uh, he provided uh, information on two of them and a lot of the other information around it. At least that's what we're being told. Is that Sergei Milion, Source 2, produced at least about half of the information. And, the, and, and then the other information, quite a bit from Sources 3 and 5, the two women. Source 6 is just a wash, it's just a phone call that happened one time, they never heard from the guy again. Sources one and four, um, you know, some information there, but we don't really know who they are. But I can assure you they're not uh, anybody of uh, importance. In fact, I don't even know if they even exist. Let's talk a little bit about Sergei Melian. He did an interview in July of 2016 with RT. He did the interview because ABC News' Brian Ross contacted him making allegations that he was a source in the dossier. Then the Wall Street Journal wrote a story, 
sort of piggybacking on the on the claims made by ABC News. Melian, I'll get to his response to them in just a moment, but what he does is after getting these seeing these two stories, where he's contacted by ABC, and then they do a story, um, and then he's con then he, then Wall Street Journal runs a story. Uh, this is all going down in July, in July. So at the end of July, like the 30th, I think, to clear his name, he decides to go on RT for a 30-minute interview. You can watch the interview on YouTube. Sergey Milian. You can watch the interview. Now, I've watched that interview four or five times. I believe Sergey Milian is telling the truth. I don't believe he's lying in this interview. And he's asked very straightforward questions. Do you know Trump? You ever met Trump? What do you have to do with Trump? The Trump campaign? The Trump organization? Um, you know, were you a source of the dossier? Is any of the things here attributed in the dossier? Is any of that stuff true? All these sorts of things, um, or any of these rumors that you're, you know, part of something or whatever. He denies everything, and, and I, I, I believe he's telling the truth. And um, he says he admits, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Trump supporter. I am a Republican. Check, you, your journalist, check it out for yourself. I make donations to the Republican Party. I'm a donor to the Republican Party. I am a supporter, a strong supporter of President Trump. That's what I believe. Now, if all that's true, then why is Sergey Milian cooperating in an effort to destroy Trump by giving information uh, to this primary subsource, Igor Danchenko, who he doesn't even know, He's put in contact with Danchenko um, by a journalist, and he has one one conversation, one telephone or teleconference call with Danchenko, just one, Milian, according to Danchenko. I'm sure Milian would deny all of this, and I pretty much believe him from where we are today. I wasn't so sure I believed him a year ago, or even six months ago, or even six days ago. But now I'm starting to believe Melian. He, he looks like he's telling the truth in that interview. He doesn't stutter or stammer. He doesn't, his eyes don't shift around. Uh, he doesn't do anything physically, body-wise, that would lead you to believe he's lying. Uh, his eyes aren't darting around. He's looking straight ahead. He's directly answering questions right off the top. He's not hesitating. He's not pausing. He, he doesn't give any, you know, ifs and ands or none of that kind of, no weasel words. Everything is very direct. No, I have nothing to do with any of this. Total denials. I'm a big supporter of Donald Trump. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I met Trump. I was in Moscow when he came for the, for the um, USA pageant. Uh, of course, I have a business in, in, the, in, the, in the United States, in New York. I have an office in Florida. I <clears throat> tried to intermediate between some investors and Trump properties to get a deal. It never happened. Uh, that's all there was to it. Uh, I did some marketing stuff. There was, there was, but there's nothing there. I mean, I don't really know Trump uh, or anything like that. So um, I trust Milian at this point is probably telling the truth. So here's where it gets interesting. Brian Ross receives a copy of the dossier with the news of the sources. Now keep in mind, the dossier, as far as we know, wasn't even completed. The final memo didn't even come out to October. The FBI didn't get it until October. Senator Magoo didn't get it till January. But yet somehow, in the summer of 2016, Brian Ross of ABC News gets a copy of the dossier with the names of the sources in it. Not redacted. He gets an unredacted copy of the dossier. Brian Ross of ABC News. And that included Milian's name. This was in early July of 2016. We're told at that time that Steele didn't even put out his first memo till July 20th. Does that make sense to you? There's a problem with the timeline, don't you think? Then, the Wall Street Journal <clears throat> follows up very shortly after that with a story because ABC News actually writes a story. We received this information. 
We tried to reach out to Mr. Melion, and the story is about how Melion might be a source in the in the in this Trump Russia stuff. They write a story saying, "Well, we got this information that Melion's a part of it, but he doesn't want to talk to us." Melion refusing to talk to ABC News. The Washington, uh, the Wall Street Journal. I'm sorry, the Wall Street Journal. Glenn Simpson's old stomping ground, along with his wife Mary Jacoby. The Wall Street Journal followed up with a story to confirm ABC's story. Of course, Melion refused to do the interview with ABC, but he did respond in an email back to ABC where he said that the dossier was fake, fake news, created by sick minds, and was an attempt to distract the future president from his real work. He says all the things attributed to him by, the, by ABC are lies and that he was not the source for the phony dossier. ABC News says in their report that intelligence experts told Brian Ross that Melion, his background, raised concerns for them. Melion says that he has never worked with Russian intelligence. He's a huge Trump supporter and a donor, a Republican to the donor, a Republican donor, uh, a donor to the Republican Party. Why would a guy who's supposedly participating in putting together a smear campaign against Trump go on TV and openly admit, proudly admit, that he's a big Trump supporter? And I believe he is. He's a capitalist. <laughs> he's a real estate investor. He's a guy that likes to do business, likes to do deals, just like Trump. He's not as successful as Trump doesn't have the talent Trump has, but, you know, he probably looks up to Trump. He'd like to be a Trump. Why would he be cooperating with someone he's never met before, who he's put in contact with by a journalist? And he's, and he's just going to drop all this information, which would be considered intelligence type information. But Melion doesn't have any intelligence background doesn't have any intelligence information, would have no way of knowing any of these things. He's out there trying to make real estate deals, trying to do all kinds of business. He's not involved in this kind of stuff. Neither, we are told, was the primary subsource. <laughs> he was in the business intelligence business. Who do you think tipped off Brian Ross to Melion? And how in the hell did ABC News get a copy of a dossier that wasn't even completed yet? I think I know. I think I know who tipped him off. I think it's our good friend Glenn Simpson. I think Glenn Simpson is the guy who tipped off Brian Ross and the Wall Street Journal. Remember? That's his old stomping grounds. Remember Lee Smith? I bought the book, read the book. Bought the book, read the book, chapter for chapter, right here on, on my YouTube video. He not only tells you about the proto-dossiers, he shows you copies of them in the book. Those proto-dossiers were basically very similar to what Steele supposedly put out in his dossier, and they were out there in Mar I mean in April and May April and May, this exact time frame. So clearly, there were dossiers out there, maybe not called the Steele dossier, but there were dossiers out there with almost the same shit that Steele was pushing three or four months later. If Brian Ross has got a copy of, the, of a dossier and Steele didn't even deliver his first copy to the FBI until July the 20th, but, but here we have... Uh, here we have Brian Ross, <laughs> apparently with a copy of it totally unredacted, in early June, in early July, two or three weeks before Steele even gives the first the first memo. It wouldn't complete until the end of October. The last memo wasn't until the end of October. You got spies running into uh, Papagalopoulos and Carter Page long before 
July. A lot of things going on before July. A lot of things going on. We have Mary Jacoby, Glenn Simpson's wife, visiting the White House on April 19th, right after Mike Rogers cut off their access to the NSA database. She goes to the White House on April 19th, 2016, the same month that Fusion was hired by the Rotten Reverend through her lawyer. Mary Jacoby, Simpson's wife, worked for Hillary Clinton at the Rose Law Firm in her hometown, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jacoby boasted on her Facebook page that her husband was the author of the dossier and that Russiagate would not exist if it weren't for her husband. She said Glenn conducted the investigation. Glenn hired Steele. Steele worked for Glenn. I believe her. I believe her. Who do you think was passing the proto-dossier around? Likely Glenn Simpson. Probably the same guy that contacted Brian Ross and gave him a copy. Who was also spreading it around all the media. Nobody would touch the story. You know why? Couldn't back any of it up. So what does uh, Glenn Simpson do? He flies steel to the U.S. and sets up appointments to meet these journalists so he can tell them firsthand. But even when they get him firsthand, interviewing him, he won't give up his sources. And they're like, well, if you can't give up your sources, we got to verify it. We can't run the damn story. Trump will sue the hell out of us and we'll have no defense. The media couldn't run with Steele's garbage. But the FBI certainly used it to launch a counterintelligence operation, to launch spies into the campaign, to get FISA warrants, and to go for Uncle Bob the Executioner's impeachment hoax. Or, or witch hunt hoax. All that. The media wouldn't write a single story about it, but the FBI ran an entire freaking coup on it. Does that sound strange to you? Professional FBI agents at the very top tier, the heads of the FBI, the director, the assistant director, the number one, number two at counterintelligence, all these other smart people around them, the very top people at the uh, in a, uh, DOJ NSD, the FBI uh, BSD, every one of them. Supposedly, I mean, these are high-level guys. And they're going to launch all this stuff on a document that they know cannot be proven. They don't even try to prove it. From day one, the FBI should have said on July 20th, when Steele walked in, in, in the FBI office in Rome and said, here's some dirt. They should have said, great, this is great, Chris. What's your sources? I mean, you can't give us any sources. We've got to verify it. Or we can't, can't do anything with it. So if you don't have any sources, don't bring it to me anymore. When we can actually verify what you got then bring it to us. The media wouldn't touch it, wouldn't write a fucking story about it. But the FBI is going to launch entire investigations without even giving a damn if they verify it, or if it even could be verified. Does that sound crazy to you? It should. My friends, when the Intelligence agencies run operations, counterintelligence agencies run operations. 90% of the operations that they run when they're running an operation are operations to uh, distract. They have one operation that they're focused on that they're running. So what they do is they run 50 other operations that are just meant to do nothing but distract you and get you, uh, to, to, to get you off their trail. So you can't follow what they're doing. They run a bunch of disinformation campaigns. They run a bunch of all sorts of things. Interference. They just run a lot of interference to hide what they're really doing. It's starting to look like to me, this entire dossier, the whole damn thing was nothing more than the distraction. It's not even the main event. It's starting to look like this entire thing was one big distraction from what they were really doing. It was the smoke and mirrors. It was to confuse and get people so they couldn't follow the trail, what was actually going on. 
because there's just too many things that don't add up. None of the timelines work. None of these timelines work. Melion's your source? Source number two? He denies everything. And you can't prove any of what... Melion, you can't prove a damn thing of what you're attributing to him in the dossier, and he's denying it all. And he'll go on TV publicly and look into the camera and tell you what he has to say. You can't get these fucking weasels. You can't get Christopher Steele to go on TV and answer some direct questions. You can't get the primary subsource. He won't even tell you what his sources are. You can't drag these people out of the FBI, the DOJ, or anywhere else to come out and look you in the face and answer some damn questions. Muleon's the guy that's out there answering your questions. No problem. Who do you think the liar is? What about Glenn Simpson? Because after all, this is a Glenn Simpson operation. That's what this is all about. Glenn Simpson, the CIA, Sidney Blumenthal, Cody Shearer, and a few insiders. That's who's running this program. All the rest of this stuff, dossiers, sources, subsources, all distraction. Total bullshit. That's what it's looking like. And we've been following this damn trail for three years. Shows you how good they are. They've had us following this dossier trail for three years. And it's the distraction. It's not the main event. The main event was happening in a tight-knit little group. Inside job. Glenn Simpson. That's where the dossier came from. With Cody Shear and Hillary Clinton and her goons. They cooked this shit up. Everything else is the smokescreen to misdirect us, and it's worked. They got everybody following it, including Durham and Barr, <laughs> and all of us. Who the hell was paying Steele's primary uh, subsources attorney? Because if you read through that transcript, you'll see it's his attorney doing a lot of the explaining and answering of questions. How'd he get so informed? Who informed the primary subsources attorney? on all of this? Who was paying his salary? I can assure you, when you sit down with the top FBI analyst, intelligence analyst, and a high-level case agent to talk about something like this, which is about national security and everything else, you're talking about having a damn good lawyer. Those guys cost thousands of dollars a day. Do you think the primary subsource was paying the lawyer? For what? He's not being charged with anything. What, he just volunteered his time? The primary sub and why did the primary subsource even do the interview? He didn't need to. He could have kept his mouth shut. He said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk to you. Get a warrant. <laughs> that would have been it. He didn't have to talk to the FBI. His lawyer didn't have to talk to the FBI. And who the hell was paying his lawyer? I bet it wasn't him. And we know it wasn't Christopher Steele and Orbis, because Christopher Steele and Orbis, according to this uh, lawyer, didn't know that uh, they were even talking to the FBI. Christopher Steele and Orbis did not know that the primary subsource had decided and agreed to talk to the FBI. So they certainly wasn't paying the lawyer. Who was? And who briefed him? In the so-called dossier, Steele dossier, it says that Source E, that would be Milion, says that there was a well-developed conspiracy of cooperation between Trump and Russia leadership managed by Manafort using Carter Page and other intermediaries. That's what's in the dossier. You know where else you'll find almost the exact same language and the exact same claim? the Intelligence Community Assessment, the ICA, both use this exact thing, which supposedly came from Milion, but he denies it all, and I believe him. The FBI never asked the primary subsource about the Trump-Russia collusion in any detail. Go through the whole interview and never really ask about it. The primary subsource only had one meeting with Milion according to him and his lawyer on the first day. The 
primary subsource tried to reach out to Milion multiple times through a journalist with, um, with a Russian name, and Milion would never respond. The primary subsource said he had a second call with Milion after the previous day, saying he had only had one call with Milion. The primary subsource says he never said anything about Putin favoring Hillary. Steel, he said Steele must have made that up. That's also in the ICA. My friends, I smell a rat. I smell a rat. Think about this. It was the FBI coup plotters from the Crossfire Hurricane team that did the interview with the primary subsource and his lawyer along with two of the top tier people from the NSD, which are up to their eyeballs in it. Stephen Soma and Brian Alton did the interview. They're part of the Crossfire Hurricane. Why did the Crossfire Hurricane team in January of 2017 decide to finally interview the primary subsource after ignoring him and doing all that they had done up to this time? I think I can tell you why. Because they knew that just in a couple of weeks, Steele was going to be outed and that the dossier, the so-called new and improved steel dossier, was going to be released because they were going to arrange for it. Comey was going to give the news hook, Clapper was going to call CNN and tell him about the news hook, and then BuzzFeed would publish it. They needed an insurance policy against steel to make sure once his name came out, he didn't get weak in the knees. That's why they wanted to have this on the record with the source. It wasn't for you. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for the record. It wasn't for anything. It was only meant for Steele. Because what does the primary subsource say? Steele's full of shit. I don't know where he got this stuff. I didn't say that. I told him I couldn't prove it. I told him that, but I said it was probably hearsay. But that, the um, Why is the FBI suddenly interested in sitting down and talking to the subsource after not being the least bit interested for all this time? Then they finally sit down to, with him to do what? To rip, the, uh, rip Steele to shreds along with the dossier. But they knew that. And why did the primary subsource do it? Does any of this make sense to you? Why did the primary subsource agree to the interview and not tell Christopher Steele, his boss? When the FBI reached out to him, why didn't he go, hey man, I better call the boss. Hey man, the FBI wants to talk to me. No. He goes behind Steele's back and does the interview. And who's paying his lawyer? What, he does it out of the goodness of his heart? <laughs> and pay that big legal fee as well? You think so? You're an idiot if you believe that. Why were there so few obvious follow-up questions to some really, really important answers? Read through the damn transcript. I'm not even a professional FBI agent. I'm reading through it. It's hard to understand because of so much redactions, but there should have been some really good follow-up questions, and there were none. He just moved right on. Why is the primary subsource telling the FBI that Steele's info is not legit? He's the damn source for it. Not Steele. And you've got Christopher Steele, supposedly a professional intelligence agent, You've got this guy here who touts himself on his uh, website as being this super professional business intelligence guy with all these contacts and all this stuff. And for $1.1 million, they come up with this bullshit that not a single large media outlet would publish a word of? Does any of this make any sense to you? Man, I think we've been hoodwinked. I think we've been hoodwinked. I think we followed the distraction. It's like a dog following a bone. Off we go. That's what I think. Think about it. Who did the interview? The FBI Crossfire Hurricane team that's behind the whole plot is going to interview the subsource and find out that it's all it's all fake. <laughs> I don't think so. 
I'm gonna have a lot more to say about this. Just wanted to give you some food for thought. I want you to chew on all that for a while. I'll be back tomorrow for more Tower Gate. See ya. Bye.